transmitting hundreds of hours of programs each week. But, can you believe this, there are people who are not entirely happy with everything that Auntie does. Over the past ten years, the person I'm after has helped disgruntled viewers voice their complaints. And when offered, their praise. Not only has she been the viewer's mouthpiece about the BBC, she's also TV's top consumer champion. And that's the programme she's doing right now, live, in a studio here, in this very complex. A lively Liverpudlian, she made her name putting her points of view as a columnist on a string of daily papers. She's also been a hit on radio as well. All a far cry from her first work in a market selling giblets on the family poultry stall. This flame-haired, tough-talking presenter is just coming to the end of tonight's show, although there is one extra item she's not expecting. Her colleague, Alice Beer, is my accomplice. I hope everyone's getting a hamper. Right, that's it for this evening. No, Annie, from all of us on the team the end of the program. I'm sorry, we have had a very important phone call from a Mr. A, and he so wants to see you. In fact, he's so desperate to speak to you. He's coming to the studio tonight to be with you, and I think he's behind you now. Good evening. <laughs> Don't swear. Don't swear. Pardon the interruption, <laughs> but we just thought we'd pop in. It's not quite the end to see what your point of view will be when I say Anne Robinson this tonight. Shot. This is your life. <laughs> to say. It's wonderful. Gosh. Anne Robinson, speechless. I am completely You're speechless. Not Alice, why lying, you are you? Me? I'm that's sorry fine. I tell you everything. But, but not <laughs> this. No, that's not playing our game. We had a studio very close to this very spot, of full of people do. to say nice things about you. Martel, how exciting. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Oh, I don't know. But you have to end <laughs> your show, don't you? I know, that's oh, yes, even more exciting. Oh, Alice. <laughs> Alice is doing it's even more exciting. Okay, I've waited more years yeah, to do okay, this. Okay, that's it for this evening. We've got rid of her from all of us on the team. Thank you very much for watching. Good night. Well, if that's your old sitting room, Naughty, everybody. Good enough. Here's to you, Ms. Robinson, and graduating to our studio, your watchdog colleagues, along with friends from the various strands of your life, and family, including the pair who helped me to meet today's deadline, your husband, John Penrose, oh. and your daughter from your first marriage, Emma Wilson. <laughs> Well, most know Anne, the fearless journalist. What about Anne at home? She told me 30 years ago that, uh, that she'd rather uh, cover the Vietnam War than hoover the sitting room carpet. <laughs> and so I don't expect to see a lot of her, uh, you know, with a can of pledge and a duster in her hand around about home. But she is great in the kitchen. She's a, a serious, serious cook. And uh, she loves uh, spending all her off time in the kitchen. That's the time apart from when she's talking to all her friends. She values her girlfriends who I'm pleased to say there are hundreds of them here tonight. They're always on the phone. That's if um, they know where to find us because the one problem in our home life has always been um, that we never know where we're going to be living at any given time. We, Anne is a perfectionist in everything that she does and we've been looking for the perfect home for about the last 20 years. So we've moved about 20 times. <laughs> <laughs> Emma, you have, have your mother's hair colour. Um, what else do you think you've inherited? Um, probably too much. Um, definitely her impatience. I spent a childhood believing I was called hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she's full of encouragement and advice, which is always nice. And, but I have learnt not to take advice on boyfriends, because there was one and she said, 
Why can't he be something useful like a removal man? <laughs> <laughs> but you've long been regarded as uh, one of this country's top news hounds through your witty and occasionally barbed comments as columnist on almost every national daily. These days you speak out from the pages of the Express. You also grab the headlines on TV on your current pet project, Watchdog, and before that, as the viewer's friend on points of view, you are the people's champion. Let's see you now at work, but look out for some added contributions. I'm Anne Robinson, by the way, Mr. Burt. She hasn't been on This Is Your Life with Judy Youngshell, all these things. She, she has kept her distance. Yes, I know my hair was ghastly. Hello and good evening. And an almost speechless Jeremy Clarkson. Almost. Now, they couldn't get a washing machine manufacturer to come and wish you well tonight, so I'm <laughs> delighted to say the job has fallen to me. Anne, congratulations. You do a great job. Keep up the good work and have a great night. It's beginning to sound like an all right trip. Dear Anne, uh, this is Anthony Newley writing, and uh, I want you to know what a privilege it is to be a part of this celebration of your life and your work. And this is your life, but I want you to know how much we've enjoyed sharing it with you. Does she know where to send the check? Next! Um, darling Anne, I just want to add my own point of view to all the lovely comments which are going to be made about you tonight. I think you're wonderful. You're a brilliant journalist. You always say all the things that we, none of us are brave enough or clever enough to say. You're a very, very good television presenter. You always look absolutely smashing and shining with lovely bright hair like a conker. And uh, you're a wonderful mother. You're a wonderful neighbour. You're a wonderful wife. I really can't say enough nice things about you, but I know you're going to have a smashing evening. So lots of luck and see you very soon. So for now, the washing line of shame is bowing out. And seizing the chance to get a word in now, your campaigning chum, Alice Beer, and fellow watchdogger, Edward Enfield. Oh, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Alice, you can speak freely. I can at last, but I do have to say that I actually don't mind her cutting me off. I mean, it is a live programme and she has to do it, and I suppose it's her show at the end of the day. I'm going to stop you there, Alice, because I <laughs> want to say that it's really so nice of Annie to let me come on her programme. She saw me somewhere or other, and she thought if ever I need an old codger for something, I'll get him. <laughs> and now she sits by me in the programme and looks after me, coaches me, she gives me little lessons. You must emphasize the names, Edward, or they won't understand. What does your famous son, Harry Enfield, think about all this? Very embarrassing, Michael, he says. Very embarrassing. He says that I'm too old to go to work and too young to put in a home, so I've set up as a television presenter <laughs> <laughs> in order to flirt with the girls, actually. That's what he put in the Sunday Telegraph. Fair enough. Alice, you were saying... <laughs> as I was saying, I echo... Make Ed it quick, Alice. Yes, yeah. 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 the watch is on. <laughs> I echo Edward's sentiments for Annie being encouraging. She's marvellous at taking people under her wing. I was terrified of her when she first came to the programme. She's well, got a that, fearful Alice. reputation <laughs> as a hard-nosed journalist. But now all we talk about are clothes, makeup, shopping and men. She offers me fantastic advice. She's been a fantastic friend as well. How wonderful. Thank you very That's much. <laughs> Josephine Robinson, this is your life. You were born on September the 26th, 1944, at Park House Nursing Home, Crosby, near Liverpool. The third child for Anne and Bernard Robinson. You never knew your elder sister, Rita, who had died in infancy. Your father was a school teacher and a gifted musician. He also taught you a love for words, didn't he? Yeah, he was great, actually. He, um, he was a great one for collecting and encourag encouraging us both to read a lot. And and to love the English language, and I think uh, it's a great tribute to him that we, uh, both of us actually, my brother and I, both chose to do something with, with words, really, and write. Well, your mother was from Irish stock yeah. and ran the family firm, a poultry yeah. business which started as a market stall and became one of the leading suppliers of meat and game in the Northwest, even supplying the kitchens of Liverpool's famous Adelphi That's Hotel. Right. As a child, you dined at the hotel's chic French restaurant, and you enjoyed luxury holidays on the Côte d'Azur. Yeah. No danger of a sunburn with that. <laughs> <laughs> but your mother kept your feet on the ground with holiday work, didn't she? She made us um, work half the holidays on the market stall. She said we had to learn where uh, the money came from to send us to, uh, to boarding school. So we had to be up at five in the morning uh, for half the holidays, and we weren't allowed. We stood. It was an outside stall. 
and we weren't allowed to say we were cold or hungry or slouch and we had to sort of give the change out properly and we had to dress the chickens and skin the rabbits and uh, dress the pheasants. So, yeah. Well, you go to the Ursuline and Birkdale convent schools and when you're six, you enroll at the Sheila Elliott Clark School of Dance and Drama <laughs> in right. Liverpool for Saturday morning elocution lessons. My father's car is a Jaguar. Hey, my, my old man's got a minivan. By Jove, I think he's got it. Your fellow pupil, who these days has a radio show on the subject of language in San Francisco, your big brother, Peter. Oh, Peter! <laughs> Peter, words were everything in your family. Yes, well, in fact, Anne and I uh, had the elocution lessons, but she won the poetry competitions, and so she would recite all these different poems, and from the beginning, um, I, I had the stutter, I had the stammer, but Anne would get the words out, and they won prizes. And then when we went on the holidays to the south of France, uh, we would play a game where you would actually pull a finger up, and that would identify a radio station. <laughs> so you would have Radio 1, third program, but whenever you pulled Anne's finger up, it was always the Anne Robinson show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Your education moves south to Yateley Hall Prep School in Surrey. Next, you go to Farnborough Hill Convent School in Hampshire. Time for a reunion. School pals Liz Hunter, Gloria Burney and Diana Donovan. Oh, wonderful! <laughs> Girls. Yes. <laughs> Little Anne gave the nuns a run for their money. Oh, absolutely. She was a real old tearaway. <laughs> <laughs> and the school was actually the palace of the Empress Eugenie, wasn't it? Yeah. It was a very posh place. The nuns were incredibly posh. Very, very much posh. more posh than we were, actually. <laughs> Tradition had it that the Empress Eugenie, her ghost, would come down once a year and put a stitch in her unfinished tapestry. And one year, Anne decided a few of us should sneak down and do it. Of course, <laughs> trouble ensued when the nuns realised it wasn't a ghost, but it was, in fact, our Annie. Thank you very much. <laughs> Home from school, the teenage Anne Robinson we see here was part of a gang known as the Hennies and would hang out at the Cardoma Cafe in Liverpool. Now, Pam Lowe, you were part of that gang and Anne would get down to some serious studies at the Cardoma. Yes, she always said she was going to be famous one day, and she would practice her autograph again and again on the cafe now. <laughs> <laughs> Emma, your mother uh, always insisted, though, that you study very hard. Yes, I thought that was rather cheeky, considering she did so poorly in her O-levels. Um, in fact, the only one she really made an effort to pass was her cookery O-level, and that was just to defy the teacher who said she'd fail. And to this day, she's actually quite a good cook, so thanks. <laughs> well, you put your port on bleu credentials to the test not long ago with a good friend who knows her way round the kitchen, and she's prepared this message on a night out in Norwich, Delia Smith. Hi, Annie. You'll never guess where I am. And I'm so looking forward to you coming here in April when we play your team, Swindon. But tonight is a special night for you, and I want to pay my tribute because I've always been an admirer of yours. I love your writing. And I also think, as a television presenter myself, that you, Annie, have the edge on all television presenters. You're the only person, the one and only one, that can look at the screen and speak to people as if you're in the room with them. I think that's an incredible gift. I'm an admirer of communication, and you've got it on all levels. I love you, Annie. To complete your qualifications, you go to Paris for a year at Les Ambassadrices Finishing School to be instructed in etiquette, good manners, and an appreciation of art. But you're not keen on this kind of stuff either. You're more interested in clothes and English newspapers. When you return to England, you go to a secretarial school in Liverpool. And then in 1964, you head to London and get your broadcasting break at Rediffusion Television as a shorthand typist. Now, sports writer Frank Keating, uh, you were her boss. What was Anne like? 
well, of course, she was a, a one-off. But you say I was her first boss, but two hours, perhaps. <laughs> Third hour, she was taking over, and fourth hour, she was saying, it was Monday, but incidentally, I won't, I won't be in until Thursday. I'm going to a May ball at Cambridge. And <laughs> but I said, oh, well, all right, then. <laughs> well, television appeals to you, but uh, not the glitzy world of the game show. You want to be a serious journalist and apply to Rediffusion's News and Current Affairs Department. You're told you need to get Fleet Street experience. And that's why you conned me into giving you a job. <laughs> From the North London News Agency, John Rogers, and with him a fellow reporter who's now MP for Hexham, Peter Atkinson. <laughs> How impressive! Got an MP here. Yes. <laughs> now, John Ann's famous now for exposing scams. What was hers then? Well, it was swinging sixties, 1966. We needed a, a new young reporter, and uh, she turned up claiming that uh, she'd worked as a uh, as a reporter for Frank Keating, and uh, but she didn't have a cuttings book. What she had was a wallet full of pictures of her dogs. I mean, <laughs> totally <laughs> believe her. But how could I resist giving her a job? I thought we might be able to toughen up this Debbie type in Holloway's Murder Mile. And you did. <laughs> Well, Peter, you come hot foot from the House of Commons to give Anne your vote. Absolutely, yeah. When she walked into the office, I mean, it was an all-male office, and our eyes were entirely on stalks when this absolutely striking redhead uh, <laughs> came, in, came into the office. We'd never seen anything like it. It was, you know, really tough, a lot of young reporters, and we made a living by selling our stories to Fleet Street newspapers. Therefore, we had to be better and quicker uh, than anybody else. And there was Annie after a few months doing exactly that, going out in the middle of the night of the early morning and bringing home the stories. Thank you very much. Great training ground. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was on your first day at the agency that you met another up-and-coming reporter, John Penrose. You proved you'd learned the ropes on August Bank Holiday Monday, 1967, when you joined a press pack outside a house in Belgravia, scene of the death of the Beatles manager, Brian Epstein. Right. While your rivals broke for a liquid lunch, you stayed on. And you got the scoop you'd been looking for. He was Brian Epstein's lawyer, Rex Makin. <laughs> Rex, how did Anne get her exclusive? Well, I had been summoned down by the family. A very doleful occasion. And I was left in Brian, beautiful Belgravia house, without the means to get back to Euston. And so I got outside, and there was a low sports car with a <laughs> ginger-haired girl. And she said, can I give you a lift? And I said, yes, please. To Euston, she said. I said, yes. We prattled all the way, and uh, she got her story. Thank you very much. Well, the Epstein story is proof enough that you are ready for Fleet Street, and in 1967, the Daily Mail's then deputy news editor, Charles Wilson, persuades the paper to take you on as a reporter. Ten weeks later, he persuades you to take him on, and you're married. Now, Charlie, uh, that led to an interesting working relationship. Well, sadly, it didn't last very long because the Daily Mail at the time had a, a rule whereby uh, married couples couldn't work together. Uh, but she stayed uh, long enough to learn um, at least one good Fleet Street disciplinary lesson. We'd been out very late one night, got up very late. Uh, but like a good wife, she cooked breakfast. And we had breakfast. Then I had to dash to the office and we agreed that she should clear up breakfast things and follow on. <laughs> I was there on time, and uh, sadly, Annie was about 20, 20, 25 minutes late. So I went out into the newsroom and uh, gave her a public dressing down about her timekeeping. <laughs> she stood there open-mouthed, and it was the first, and I think the only time in my life I've seen Annie Robinson speechless. <laughs> <laughs> After a brief spell on the Sun's woman's page, you moved to the Sunday Times and helped set up the Insight Consumer Unit. You are also sent to brave the bombs and report on the troubles in Northern Ireland. There was a friendlier reception waiting for you from one of Belfast's leading local reporters of the time, our own dear Henry Kelly. Yeah. 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 It's such a 
long time ago. Stop talking about time. God, we had some good some times, time Henry. It was some time. But at that time, Henry, you were with the Irish Times. I was. I was with the Irish Times. We had a flat in which visiting far persons like yourself used to occasionally stay. And I have a world exclusive for everybody tonight because we had a famous party there once when the Muir Hotel was bombed. And we, two of the first Russian visiting journalists came. And they brought with them real, genuine, strong Russian vodka. Did too. And that was the night when the famous <laughs> Robinson Wink was first created. <laughs> it has nothing to do with her friendliness. It was to do with Russian drink. <laughs> God bless you. You're a wonderful guy. Thank you, Henry. In 1970, your daughter, Emma, is born, but soon after your marriage to Charlie ends. You and John meet up again, and for a time you join him in Italy, where he's the Daily Mirror's Rome correspondent. But the 70s were dark days for you, as the pressures of work took their toll. You recently written about that time in your life. Was that a difficult thing to do? I think it was. It was a very tough time in my life. I mean, I think I drank for England for a bit. And actually, what's really wonderful about this evening is there's an awful lot of people here. John, Emma, Charlie, a lot of my friends here. And I wouldn't be here without them, actually. It was, it was a dark, terrible time. And I somehow got through it, and it wouldn't be without the people in this room tonight. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Well, as you've said, uh, John and many of your other friends are great support, and, and you fight back. Part of your recovery sees you return to your roots. In 1978, you joined the Liverpool Echo as features editor and columnist. Now, Steve Anderson, you went on uh, to work with Anne recently as editor of Watchdog, but you also saw her campaigning side at the Echo. She was a great inspiration on the Echo. The circulation boosted as a result of her column, and she was back on song again. Well, there was more good news in 1980 when you and John marry. Uh, John, you're actually more than a husband to Anne, aren't you? Anne Robinson, Inc. is what I call it now. Uh, it's the toughest job I've ever had, is running the, uh, the Annie business. And what I'd like to say, just to correct any impression, that false impression that may have been given this evening, is that there is a gentle and caring side to Annie. Uh, there is, honestly. She's, she's got some very close friends, and she's, she's my best friend after 32 years, so... Um, I'm glad that we can present the other side of Annie. So. Oh, there's more of that to come. <laughs> in 1979, the call comes to return to Fleet Street. You're invited to join the Daily Mirror. The men behind that comeback were former Mirror Supremos Richard Stott and Mike Malloy. Richard, you wanted to give Anne a chance. Yes, well, I'd known her for a long time, and uh, I knew her as a brilliant reporter, and uh, I wanted her onto the Daily Mirror, and uh, we eventually got her on, and she went uh, straight through the hierarchy, of course, features uh, editor, woman's editor, assistant editor. What we really wanted was uh, a woman's columnist, which are difficult to get hold of now as well as then. And I eventually said, look, uh, Mike, the person we've got, or should have, is the person who is staring us right in the face. It's Annie. And that was it, apart from the nightmare then for sub-editors, because uh, one word of Annie's copy changed. <laughs> and right down the newsroom came the clump of death. <laughs> and these poor guys were standing there and waiting. So her copy went in absolutely perfectly. And as it should, she's a great columnist, wonderful columnist. But Mike, you would agree then that Anne really shaped up. Oh, enormously. Yeah. She's a difficult person. <laughs> Annie. She's a, and feisty, but uh, she's very brave. She writes very bravely. She was a terrific writer. Her other skill, of course, was a, she was a very talented executive. She edited the paper when the Belgrano sank in the, in the Falklands War, but television called and television took her away, so it was Fleet Street's loss. Thank you very much. You've used both newspapers and TV to boost a cause close to your heart. At the height of your success on Fleet Street, your mother was suffering with Alzheimer's disease. Now, Harry Caton, your chief executive of the Alzheimer's Disease Society, and Anne's been a great help to you. Yes, when, uh, when Anne's mother was ill, she ran our Alzheimer's helpline, and I hope the help we gave her was no different from the help Fantastic. we gave anyone else. But She's been kind enough to say that at that time the Alzheimer's Disease Society saved her life. And since then, what she's done with courage, talking publicly and honestly about a disease that many celebrities still find difficult 
to talk about when it affects their lives. She's used her skills, her communication skills, to promote our cause, and she's paid us back so many times with her support. Thank you. Thank you. another group that you give your time to. You're so proud of your involvement, you listed in your entry in Who's Who. I refer to the Bybury Tennis Club, which I understand is quite an elite membership. There's only four of us. <laughs> well, there's Rupert Perry, who is here. As you know, the other members now live in San Diego, but yeah. they're not there tonight to complete the Brian Bybury Janine. Tennis Club. Brian oh, and Janine Shepherd. Oh. has a very important role in your club. She certainly does, Michael. She is the uh, president for life. But, um, I should point out in true Annie style, she did nominate herself for this. <laughs> she was unanimously approved, though. Yeah. <laughs> Jenny, is Anne a good loser? I think I'm going to be diplomatic here and say she's a brilliant winner. <laughs> <laughs> nice of her. Thank you very much. <laughs> Now, before we put this show to bed, let me remind you that you have acknowledged your debt to one of this country's finest television journalists. You first appeared with him in 1983, and this is how he introduced you then. Welcome to another question time for 60 minutes of topical cut and thrust on issues raised by our invited audience. Around the table with me, Anne Robinson is further <laughs> evidence of how women are steadily scaling the heights of power. She's the only woman who actually edits a Fleet Street newspaper. To find out if he's changed his opinion, time to question Sir Robin Day. How nice to see you. What do you want to know? Well, I want to know your views on Anne Robinson. Oh, well, I think she's done quite well, considering. <laughs> but I think she must be under the mistaken impression that she's the only glamorous lady whom I flattered by saying they ought to go into television. <laughs> but she's not, but she's done better than any of them. <laughs> but what I really like about you, Anne, is that you used to have a radio program. And you used to ask me on the radio. I program. know, and you were wonderful. Well, I know I was wonderful, but you were even better. <laughs> and you used to let me play all my own records and old songs, and you played them all with a very good temper. Thank you very much. And you're a great star, and I had absolutely nothing to do with it. He is the man who got me into television, and I'm very, very, very you grateful. Must, you mustn't tell people that. And you always remember my birthday. Well, that brings us all to the 26th. Yes, very really good. They got it right, too. Yeah. <laughs> I do get some things right. Thank you very much. Anne Robinson, this is your life. And Alice Beer is back in a moment on BBC One with Watchdog Health Check.